like you who had a close relationship with Deborah Gordine and that was the person to write. That's my summation. She's the one who actually gave you a letter to look at in her office. That's my summation. So, I mean, you know, clearly we have to get Deborah Gordine to answer some of these questions. But uh, I've got a lot of problems with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I have many more questions, but I'm happy to yield to my friend from Ohio. So I might I um, feel a little squeezed out here. I was kind of waiting for my turn, but with so many yielding, uh, many of the questions I had in front of my mind are gone. I, however, have a couple of questions on the basic same topic. But I'd like to try to understand it from the layman's standpoint. Three things. First of all, the letter to which my colleague referred time and time again was a letter that basically laid out the elements of an agreement. Is that correct? Um, are we discussing... Um, the the sorry, Deborah Mr. Gordine Lucas, letter? Are we discussing the letter in from um, my client into the Deborah one signed by Deborah Gordine is the, that we brought down. This letter. Yeah. This was the agreement that was no, worked out with Mr. Demery and Mr. Demery's attorneys and myself and no, other mm -hmm. attorneys. I'm trying to understand, is this usual procedure that you would first get together a bevy of lawyers and interested parties, including HUD, uh, usually at HUD, and work out the elements of an agreement? Is that usual procedure? That is usual. That is not unusual? That is not unusual. At times, I think I'm having an out-of-the-body uh, political experience here. I'm not sure. Now, what is extraordinary, apparently, is that the whole operation came about under uh, Ms. Dean rather than directly to the secretary because of the importance, the vast importance of this. Is that unusual from your experience at HUD and from your experience as a lawyer working with HUD matters? Um, that a special assistant or executive assistant to the secretary would have this much responsibility to do these things as opposed to taking it directly up to a Mr. Demery or Mr. Pierce? Um, this, I don't know why this letter went in back into De Deborah. Um, in my experience, the few times that I've gone up to the secretarial level, uh, it would be unusual for an, uh, an executive assistant to sign a letter. So I, it, this is unusual. That's what this, I'm getting at. And again, I can only surmise it's because the letter went into her and Mr. Demery wanted to let it go out from her. I do I'm, not know why. I'm happy to have your guesstimates and your surmises and your thoughts. I just, that's really all I want this day. I'd like to get a general yes or general no as to whether or not this is accepted procedure as we used to say in the military, SOP, Standard Operating Procedure. What bothers me about this whole series of hearings, most of all, is that there is apparently a total lack of SOP, or Standard Operating Procedures, in HUD, especially since the death or demise of Fair Share, and especially in MHR. Now, back to the letter writing phenomenon that we've encountered here. You're, you first encountered heat and I think legitimately from this committee, regarding your ability to read a letter or peruse it, if you like. And to me, 15 minutes, I must tell you, um, uh, I think is, even though it's a very technical letter, since you deal in that kind of thing every day, I, I would think that you more nearly read it in all, in all honesty than, you know, peruse it. 15 minutes is a long time to have a letter or 10 minutes to grasp the body of it. But I'm trying to understand why you're in that position or anyone else would be in that position of being able to read that kind of official blockbuster, because to me that was a blockbuster letter. Now let me try to make it easy for you and be very fair to you. In the writing of that kind of letter, would that take 60 days or six months? Would it take a long time for all these people you mentioned time and time again to get together and finally have a final draft or nearly final draft ready for the Secretary's approval or signature? A letter of that length, in my experience, would take an awful long time to be put together. Could you frame it for me in time? I would say it would take a, I would say weeks. I'd have to look at the, um, you know, if you get the HUD internal documents, they'll show you the original time it was done and by the time it went out and signed. I understand that. I'm not trying to be unkind. And in fact, I'm trying to bend over backwards to be as fair as I can because I think, you, you know, you, you've been pushed quite a bit today. And, probably with great justification. On the other hand, I'm trying to really understand a little bit of the process. I don't see why any attorney for any interested party would be able to see a letter of this great import. And it is, you know, an unusual letter. This is an un extraordinary circumstance. Uh, unless you had been so involved with HUD procedures when you were there, and you maintain an active liaison or interest in an activity with HUD officials on other various HUD matters as a HUD lawyer, 
particular tax policy and F, uh, FHA attorney, et cetera. Had this happened to you before, had they given you other letters to read as a matter of courtesy or because of their respect for your uh, talent and experience, which is substantial, had this occurred before? Had you been allowed, have you been allowed to read other letters in other offices on other matters affecting your firm's clients or your clients? Um, I don't have a specific knowledge, but I will, if I can try to explain, I mean, this sounds like um, that I was coming in and writing letters for the department and leaving. And the, there was an app question, how long did these letters take to get generated? And they weren't generated from whole cloth. There were active negotiations. When I go into HUD representing a client on a workout, there are active negotiations. We actively review the documents. It's very common. It's not like these letters haven't gone through uh, several drafts. And I said, I did not see it until it was finally done. Then you're saying the ability of a known ingredient person, a professional, not employed by HUD, that it is not uncommon for that person to be privy to the motion of a letter in draft or a policy document in draft as it proceeds through various levels of HUD. That is correct, Mr. Lucas. And this is not, and, and I'm not trying to uh, excuse you, I, I still understand the ability, you see, of a person who has a legitimate professional paid interest being able to see a final document. I mean, that really bothered me, I have to tell you that. Yes. But I would understand if you were a participant in and a contributor to the beginning stages of a letter, given it takes six months, for for example, to work its way through the bureaucracy. This is what fascinates and I think frustrates so many common, ordinary people who have tried to do business. They don't have six months staying power. <laughs> Professional, high-powered types uh, do, of which I consider you to be one. I don't mean this unkindly, but I mean this uh, exactly. Now, why I'm still fascinated by the policy that at certain levels where it has taken on a potential importance to a department and life or death DRG and perhaps to York as a change in policy or a, uh, a shift in policy policy or in this case a reversal of policy where it takes on that life and death matter to the company involved I, I am concerned by the ability of you or any other person in your uh, position to be able to take a look at that although you may well know what it's going to say you may be familiar with 75% of it. It is unfair, an unfair advantage, in my opinion, for any person representing an interested party at that stage to say, and I'm trying to determine in my mind, if it took six months to develop and you had a hand in 30% of it or 50% of it or 2% of it, it obviously is very important to you and your law firm's client at a certain stage what that letter is going to say. And that's the unfairness I have trouble with. Now, one last thing, let me ask you a question in this regard. Okay. I've been making my little speech, and I didn't mean to do that. From the moment you saw it, do you have any idea how long it was going to be, days, hours, or weeks, until the secretary was going to see it and make it policy? How much head start, not that it excuses anything, but how much time was it that you knew what the letter essentially said in a 10-minute perusal? I believe representations were made at the staff level um, to the, my partner who was negotiating the individual deals that it was coming out immediately. I mean, it was one of those things that everybody was pushing very hard. This was a, an ongoing process. So it could have been that it was signed that day or the next day or within the next few it days at least. And was it actually signed in the next few days? I, I do not know. I'm assuming it was signed that day. We, do, we have not yet located the date on which you were there. And I'm not going to be able to tell you. I'm so sorry. I, I just don't have a record of this. I am concerned, I guess, about so many, not high-priced individuals, but high-powered individuals who have this kind of daily access to the center of government, especially those areas where awards, grants are awarded and money is, is uh, assigned, policy is set that affects uh, corporate entities represented by so many attorneys in this particular city. I know that. And the casualness with which apparently many of our very qualified, very honorable and competent professional governmental employees 
can allow a former employee to walk in and out of an office, you see, and have access to things that I, as a member of Congress, have difficulty obtaining uh, by calling the secretary or his immediate assistant or the congressional liaison person. I like this. It may take me weeks to get something like this. And I don't know what it would be if I'd asked the same letter at the same time. I might have gotten it that day, but I'm really frustrated as an elected member of this body by the ease with which non-elected people have access to centers of power and centers of uh, money grants that I don't have as an elected member. So uh, you see, that's a difficulty I have in my mind. Uh, we have a member in the committee of uh, Mr. Wise, though, very pointedly stated his problem with his high-priced consultants. He couldn't get a legitimate grant for the state, what, state of West Virginia, his hometown. And we got people walking here, made three, $304,000, apparently had no problem getting those kind of grants. I've never had a grant that I know of for HUD in my hometown that I ever went after and had success with. So we have difficulty because we're supposed to represent the people who need these things. We see it firsthand. We come up here and we see people outside the framework, not elected. Not only that, but making lots of money using the system the way in which I think we did not intend it. And I give my last speech. I'll give you the opportunity to respond to that the problem that I have in addressing this uh, sequence of events, if, if you care to do so. I'm a HUD practitioner. I work at HUD. I worked at HUD I'm a lot. There are very many HUD practitioners in this city. Things don't come out when you're negotiating on a particular project where you're representing your client, the developer. HUD does not work in a vacuum. We have to give them our side of the story. And everybody's viewpoint was how to do the best thing for the government. And in that process, there's two opposing views that can work together. We can give information they can't. So it's very common for us, those of us in the HUD, uh, HUD area, including the trade associations and everything, to participate in question and answering and reviewing policies. It's very, it's very common for a HUD practitioner when representing a client to negotiate with the staff, not dictate, but give information. And I think that's what I was doing in this process vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, what Mr. Shays asked about, which was this letter. Uh, and uh, this letter was not something, it was very technical, and it was something that was negotiated not with Deborah Gordine. She was not involved at all from my point of view. If I might, uh, Mr. Chairman, I have, uh, Mr. Murphy, no, no quarrel with that. I find myself in agreement with your last statement. I have two overviews. We just offered them. I, yeah, I don't think I brought up yeah. Ms. Dean in any regard, yeah. in, in, in this regard, certainly with the letter. It's just that I want to understand the process and how unusual, if unusual, the handling of this letter was. And I still find it unusual in my mind. I have to tell you that at that moment. I do not argue with the input daily, hourly, monthly of those knowledgeable individuals outside HUD who must work with HUD. Absolutely. But this is different. This is a letter on which we cannot agree at which stage of final uh, finality it is in, but it is almost ready to be signed by the secretary that represents a turnaround in policy, and a person who does represent a vested interest has access to it. That's my problem. At that point, there's a certain level where HUD should just cut it off. <laughs> It's now a HUD decision. You see, that's my problem. And we've entered that stage where the secretary is ready to make a decision, or apparently it's been made for him in, 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 in an oblique manner. And I don't think that vested interests, commercial vested interests, have any right to it at that stage. That's my problem at, at, with this whole scenario. Uh, I admire what you do. I, I, you're a very informed, intelligent, experienced witness. But I'm, again, Mr. Chairman, I'll fade away for the day with this. It bothers me the, the cavalier attitude, which some assume in, um, in expecting entree to powers of center and powers of decision within government in the executive branch, to which most of those, those of us in the legislative branch are refused. And that's really, truly beginning to get on my nerves, that when we ask on behalf of our constituents, for legitimate consideration, for necessary housing funds, and they're gone. I turn around and find they're all gone to the big deals in, in Washington, D.C. It's beginning to really get, get into me. I understand now why some of these other gentlemen and on this panel have become intense 
the more I think about it, the less of a chance those, my, those whom I represent will ever have of ever getting any HUD funds because the system has been abused by people who should not have been allowed to operate in the manner in which they're operated. And IG reports were ignored by the Congress as well as the executive branch over a long period of time. So having given my last political speech, let me thank the chairman for his indulgence. Very good. Uh, I think we'll have to return to this, but I want to move on now to other things. Describe for me, if you would, the Churchill Richmond, Virginia project. That's a project um, in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, it's a project that is 100%. Uh, pull, pull the mic closer, please. It's a 100% um, Section 8 mod rehab project. What was your involvement with it? My involvement, I have represented the developer in this particular project since 1982. In evolving strategies. Who is, who is the developer? Uh, would you indulge me, please, to I'll be happy to. Um, Mr. Chairman, as you know, I'm an attorney and I have client confidences. Um, those confidence require me at times to guard the client's confidentiality uh, and not divulge things that they don't wish to regarding if it's the matter they represent, the, the person, the fact of representation and fee arrangements. Um, that is something that which I am bound by the canon of ethics. Uh, I, is there perhaps a way that you could indulge me in giving the information that this committee needs regarding this project that perhaps we cannot breach this at this time? because this is a very good project with a good story. Well, the availability of the attorney-client privilege to witnesses before it is a matter subject to the discretion of the chair. You are familiar with that ruling. The exercise of that discretion may be informed by weighing considerations of investigative need, public policy, and the statutory duty of the subcommittee to engage in continuous oversight of the agencies that fall within its jurisdiction against any possible injury to the witness. In view of this, I'm now directing the witness to answer the question. Mr. Chairman, my client in this uh, was a developing company named um, D.B. Fry & Company, uh, based in uh, D.B. Fry & Company. What contact did you have with respect to this project with Ms. Dean? Um, I have no specific recollection of any contact specifically on this. I do have a rec recollection of meeting with Debbie uh, sometime in 1986 discussing this pro not this project, but the procedures and policies uh, regarding this, pro regarding which would affect this. This is one of three or four projects that I was working with the developers who were interested in obtaining HUB subsidies. Ms. Murphy, I'm going to send down a letter on your law officer's stationery, your own personal stationery signed by you. Could you read this letter, including the date? Could you give me a second? I'll be happy to.
Mr. Chairman. Um, Could you please read the letter for the record? Or would you prefer that I read well, it? Well, first of all, I do not recognize the signature on this letter, nor do I recognize the typewriter. Um, I have with me my assistant, and she doesn't either. I will be glad to read the letter into the record. Uh, do you recall the letter? No, I do not. Is this your stationery? This is my law firm stationery. The letter came from HUD Files. Yes, I see that. No, I, I agree. This is my stationery. I simply do not remember this letter. And I, I, I'm, I accept that. I accept that. The letter reads as follows. Go ahead. It's, date, it's dated September 29, 1986. Thank you for your efforts for the Churchill Richmond, Virginia project. For your information, as stated in the letter from the city of Richmond, dated September 12, 1986, the Churchill project has been selected for moderate rehabilitation Section 8 award for advertising by the city. Therefore, if practical, the units can be sent out project specific on the 185 NOFA. If you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to contact me. And the notation, I presume, in Ms. Dean's handwriting at the bottom of the page? Spoke with Linda 10 30, 9, 30, 86. Um, does this refresh any memories? Chairman, first of all, I does not. Well, did you intervene on behalf of this project with HUD? I had discussions with Debbie on a whole broad range of things, and I'm, I don't think it was September 1986. I think it was earlier. Um, Could this be the signature of your secretary? Um, I'm asking my legal assistant here who worked with me at the time that we had the secretary in. Do you what initials are JJD? Whose initials are JJD? That would be Jennifer Donnelly. And who is that person? Uh, she was uh, a secretary that I believe had started with me at this time. Is it reasonable to assume that she would have generated the letter without your approval? No, it's not. And it's not reasonable that I would have sent this letter with these typos in it either. Me I'll be happy to indulge you, Ms. Murphy. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, that has, has anything come, come back to you? No, I do not recognize this letter, and I apologize. Well, uh, um, do you recall that Ms. Dean spoke to you the following day by telephone concerning this project, as the notation seems to indicate? No, um, I do not. Is it reasonable to assume that you wanted this project approved, Ms. Murphy? I, it was one of your clients? This was one of my clients, yes it was. Is it reasonable to assume that you want to see your client's project approved? That's correct, sir. That would be correct. Since you had regular contact with Ms. Dean, is it reasonable to assume that you discussed this matter with her? Yes, it would be. Would it be reasonable to assume that Ms. Dean was helpful to you and got the project approved? Um, it would be reasonable to assume that. And would it be reasonable to assume that subsequent to the approval, you would write a thank you note to her? No, 
It's not. Because Why this, not? Because this project, um, this project, and I have to go back to, this project was funded in 1987. Um, so uh, it was funded a year later. Um, it was funded, if I remember correctly, it was funded in dribs and drabs, 100 units, 20 units, 40 units, over the course of uh, two years. Um, well, you are, you are not uh, in conflict with that uh, statement. You are saying, therefore, if practical, the units can be sent out project-specific, etc. Right. So you are, you are thanking her for approving the project. As I said, this project was approved much later, but I might thank you for your efforts. I don't know whether she approved it, and it was approved much later. Well, will you uh, look into your own files and get back to the committee on that? Let me move on to another subject, if I may. Describe for the subcommittee, if you would, your discussions with a company called Association Financial Corporation. It's a Los Angeles corporation. Um, in October of 1988, um, I met with a gentleman um, concern, who came in, he had a troubled project or represented that he represented the developer, Associated Financial, um, who had a troubled project in San Francisco. Um, he asked me what could be done with this project. Was there subsidy available, et cetera? Uh, this was a, we sat and discussed the project, and I'll go back in my memory. He, the project was a project that had rental rehab in it, it had some Section 8 in it. Um, it was having problems. I believe it was FHA insured. And he came in and asked us if there's anything we can do to help this project. We said we'd take a look at it and take it under advisement. Um, <clears throat> we subsequently did some research on the project. It was rental rehab, so it was not eligible for mod rehab. In any event, the mod rehab had already been awarded, my understanding at that time, for fiscal 88 and 50. Fiscal 89, but it wasn't eligible ab initio. It had it violated 882.401, which says you can't have previously assisted a, a prog project in the HUD mod rehab program. We went back to them and said, well, let's take a look at some other things. Got some more information. We said we'd get back to them. We subsequently made some phone calls, or I, we got some information. Um, this was going to be a very tough project to do. It was a project that already had layers of subsidy. It was a project, apparently, from the information we got, was well known. It had problems in the management. It was a, it was a project that we simply uh, were not able to take one of the many HUD programs that, to fix a troubled project and overlay this program with it. Did you submit a proposed contract to this company? Yes, we did. I will send down a copy of that proposed contract to you. Is this a contract uh, signed by you, yeah. Ms. Murphy? Yes, it is. I will not ask you to read the entire letter, but I want to read a portion of the next to the last paragraph. The client, which is this company, will reimburse your company for all out-of-pocket costs and expenses incurred by you in the performance of consulting services, including but not limited to travel expenses, long-distance telephone calls, courier and mailing expenses, and duplication expenses. A non-reimbursable retainer fee of $5,000 is due upon the execution of this agreement. As and for further consideration of your performing services under this contract, Clients shall pay you the sum of $1,200 per unit. And then it describes how the fee is to be paid. Is this a customary way for a legal firm to bill its clients? Um, what well, is true that legal, we calculated legal fees on the per unit basis because 
the clients, as they come, came in, wanted to have some idea when we started working on a project, what would be the end result. And the way we calculated it was easy to say it would be, it would be based on a per unit basis. This, we had many internal discussions about this in our firm because, as you know, we, do, we also do personal negligence work. And in personal negligence work, you take up an upfront retainer. You do your work. This is, this is not, a pers this no, is not personal negligence but work. But you asked me a question, Mr. Chairman. Please, yes, I did. Um, regarding is this customary. Our firm, if we took a personal negligence case, would take an upfront fee and, as customary, would get paid at the time of settlement a percentage of the fee. We had made that analysis. It's accepted under the canons. We accepted it. The per unit basis was based on a couple things, one of which is most of the projects we dealt in were troubled projects. The average time we worked on was 16 to 24 months from beginning to end. This project that we were dealing with was an indeed a troubled project. Secondly, we in, in drafting this contract had got, consulted with HUD because we were concerned as lawyers, as professionals, and we authorized one of our partners to send to HUD this type of contract to see if it was acceptable because we too had questions of this and we received an opinion from the council that this was acceptable. That is correct and, uh, and without objection the chair will enter into the record the memorandum you received from HUD. Um, when the secretary Carla Hills appeared before the subcommittee she made a major point of the fact that she billed on an hourly basis and not on a per unit basis. This seems to be billing on a per unit basis. Do you think that uh, there is any proper differentiation between the two billing procedures? Yes, there is. We're, we're a transactional law firm. When we do bond work, when we do underwriters counsel work, when we do closing work, we do not get paid until the loan closes. It's standard practice. And that's why our structure is built on that. Because in some cases, after the project, after we figure out where the subsidy, if the subsidy, what, what we can work out in a workout scenario can be, at that time, our work only begins. Our work is, for example, we do the bond side if we have to. We'll, we'll put you with the bond council, or we will be bond council. We will structure your financing. We will look at it as a taxable bond versus a taxable bond, a tax exempt bond. We will structure it with different syndicators and work with the client on the syndicators. We will structure the, if there's any zoning or other legal issues, we will work with them. To the extent one of the various uh, band-aids, I will call them, that's available in the HUD um, treatment is available, we will work with you in understanding the rules and regulations that govern that. Ms. Murphy, I fully understand that you are extremely knowledgeable about HUD-related activities, but it would seem to me that you as an attorney, like other attorneys, would want to bill on a time basis. Uh, to the naked eye, this appears like the same kind of per unit arrangement that uh, Mr. Watt used in billing his clients. Mr. Lantos, as I explained, as bond counsel, we get billed at closing. This estimate of, on this particular This was not an estimate. This was a $1,200 per unit proposal. This particular charge, it has been our experience that we work from 16 to 24 months on these projects, that we're billing hours of three, four, five hundred hours. And in some senses, some cases the projects go through, some cases we simply can't put the whole thing together. So this, in our opinion, is a reasonable estimate for this particular project. You really don't expect me to believe this, Ms. Murphy. You really don't expect any rational person to believe that a complex, unpredictable set of legal involvement by a law firm is estimated at the outset of that work at 1,200 units, $1,200 per number of units in the project. I mean, you clearly don't tell me that if there were twice as many units in the project, 
or half as many units in the project, the amount of work involved would be different. Well, I think the lar if you looked at it, the, the complexity of the project usually was in the smaller versus the larger. I stipulate the complexity of the project. I am directing you to the question I am probing. Ms. Carla Hills, former secretary of HUD, who was also employed, for instance, by DRG, made a major point of her billing procedure. Namely, her billing procedure related to the number of hours performed on a project. That is how lawyers typically bill. Here, you look at a complex project and you send your client a contract signed by you charging him $1,200 per unit. There is no rational way of explaining that that corresponds to any hourly billing fee that your firm has. What it corresponds to is the kind of work that James Watt performed, or our previous witness performed, although I grant you there is a legal component in your efforts. Mr. Lantos, I can only cite, for example, in all our closing work, we do not bill if the project does not close. In all the bond work that we do, we do not bill if the project does not This was close. not bond work, was it? But it is transactional law, and this is the same type. It is structuring, working with the client. And when it closed, most lawyers, if they do closing work... Can you define gets, transactional law for the uninitiated? It is the process of culminating... Is it a commonly used phrase? Yes, it is. And uh, Particularly define it for me. For example, I, I, I think it's best to define it in the context of what is done. A transaction, when complete, has a value to the client. Prior to that, all your legal work is building up to something where you may not get an end result. Uh, it is uh, ongoing, specific, it is not... Um, it is, is, it's a closure, a bond transaction. A closure. Well, let's simplify it. Let's assume that it's the, it, it, it's the purchase of a home. Would that be handled on a transactional basis? Yes. Well, would you say that uh, I handle the legal work for selling a home for $1,200? Or would you say, depending on the number of hours of legal work I put in, my legal fee being X, I will charge you on the basis of the number of hours put in. It, it's true. In our bond practice, we will quote as a half a point on the deal. This was not a bond. No, but I'm, I'm, I'm liking yeah. two transactional uh, systems of doing law work. I'll be happy to yield to my friend. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I think that uh, before the witness digs herself in any deeper, you might really want to re rethink exactly what the nature of your relationship was with this particular company. Look at the opening paragraph of the letter of understanding, the contract of understanding that you submitted. The fact is that you're not representing this client as attorneys. You're representing them as financial and real estate consultants. Isn't that correct? No. Well, would you read the first paragraph? I, I, will, I will stipulate that that it says it's financial. Read the first paragraph, would you? This letter confirms our oral understanding that uh, Barrett, Montgomery, and Murphy is willing to act as a financial... Associates. Under... Left out a word. Associates. Is willing right. to act as financial and real estate consultant to associated financial corporation client to assist in the acquisition and or development of real estate holdings now owned or those acquired. And read the, read the for opening lines of the next paragraph. Uh, in our capacity as consultant, we will... Right. So you're not, you're not appearing as attorneys in this matter. You're appearing as consultants. And it seems to me that all the discussions about your legal fees and your concerns about the canons of ethics are valid, but in fact what you did was to try to go around that by casting yourselves not as attorneys, but as consultants in this situation. Isn't that right? That is not correct. 
What well, the then, then explain I, why this is cast as, cons as a consultant's Mr. contract rather than as a retainer Mr. of your law firm. Mr. Weiss, let me agree. Let me go on. Research on regulation issues and matters relating to the Department of Housing or State Housing Finance or Public Housing Agencies, advice regarding legislation, regulations, budget decisions, and other policies affecting the financing of rental housing. Uh, these are work, I mean, you can have a legal component and a uh, consultant component. What I'm telling you is we functioned in working for these, and I can sit down and talk to this, in particular into this project. We did the research and the regulations. We determined for this client that what was available to them would not work. 882-401 prohibited this. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I'm not going to pursue it at this point. I, I thank you for yielding. But I would suggest, uh, Ms. Murphy, that you really want to review your testimony and your, your line of thinking in this regard. Mr. Thank Chairman? You. Yes. Uh, may I ask a uh, Of course. Mr. Uh, a number of individuals came to us and said they knew the going rate was 1000 to $2,000 per unit. Uh, did, were you aware that other consultants were charging 1000 to $2,000 a unit? No, I was not. So your testimony is you had no idea that anyone else was no. charging per unit rates? Oh, if my testimony is, did they charge them per unit? Yes, I was aware in the industry that yeah. was being done. And what, and what was, I said 1,000 to 2,000. What, what did you think they were charging? I did not have, I didn't consult with other people, so I'm not sure what they were charging. Did you ever have a discussion with Deborah Gordine in which she talked about what people were making? No, not to my recollection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chairman and chief executive officer of this company uh, met with you in the fall of 88, is that correct? No, um, I believe I met with the chairman sometime after that. I met with a, a person he engaged to, to try to help him out on some, some of his project, troubled projects. I'd have to go back and review my records, but I remember meeting with uh, well, your letter to him is dated October 28. Right. Is I it reasonable to assume right. that you met with him prior no, to that? I, I think I met with his, his, somebody that was on his staff, and then I later met with him. Well, let me read the letter. Dear Mr. Rosette, this letter confirms our oral understanding. Now, was this oral understanding arrived at through a telephone conversation or through an in-person meeting? Uh, I met with uh, Mr. Sears, who present said he worked for Mr. Rosette yes. on October 17th. October 17th. That's correct. And on October 28th, you submit a, uh, a proposed contract. That's correct. Mr. Rosette tells committee investigators that you explained to him that you could get mod rehab units at $1,200 per unit, that you needed a letter from the Public Housing Authority, and the developer had to work out with the Public Housing Authority how the units would be awarded to the specific project. Is this an accurate representation of your discussions with No, them? it wouldn't be, because at this time in October 1988, and I have to go back, this project was not eligible for mod rehab, either in the initial discussions um, or in later uh, research. And my understanding of that time is that there was no, simply no mod rehab available. Well, on what basis did you submit the contract at $1,200 per unit? In my discussions with Mr. Sears, we went over the beginnings of the project. I asked him questions about it. What was the problem with it? Uh, where was it? Was it was it HUD insured? Did it have other subsidies? Um, what were the numbers of the units? What were the vacancy rates? Um, what was the feeling if this was a troubled project in a HUD project? What were HUD's feelings about this? Mr. Sears at the time told me it was a good project. The city supported it, etc. I said we would do our research, take a look at this, and get back to him. But before we did it on this type of, of case, because this was a new client. Um, we would want a retainer. So Murphy, will you tell us about uh, the Village at Somerset project in Pennsylvania? It's a project for which I worked on for my a client. 
It was a project that had severe cash flow problems. Uh, it was a project in which I was retained to analyze the regulations to determine whether it was eligible for any kind of rent increase. Uh, in the process of that, I sought the uh, Assistant General Counsel approval of HUD of certain issues that they were eligible under the statute and regulations for rent increases. I believe it's um, 883408. Um, we subsequently obtained that um, approval. Um, this was one of the items I t spoke of early in my testimony, uh, Mr. Chairman, when I said there was a time when there was no acting that certain issues that we were having problems just getting them done. What was Ms. Dean's role in this project? I appealed to Deborah, Deborah after, and I'd have to go back and look at my records. I'm sorry I, I, if I had known this was coming. This was a project where the developer had been working over a period of two years with the housing authority and the local HUD office. Uh, this was in a Section 883 regs. So that means it was financed with state housing finance agency bonds. Um, they had severe problems with their contractor, and I'm going from memory, but this is two, a couple years ago. They had severe problems with the contractor. They had uh, some unusual maintenance costs, um, some things that were normally not within the cubbyhole or the niche that one would put a special rent adjustment under the 883 regulations. Um, we worked with them in, anal in doing an analysis of their costs, an analysis of um, the regulations as it pertains, and we found simply that the regulations weren't clear. We made, we presented, and I'm sorry I don't have it, an argument to the General Counsel for Assisted Housing that the statute and the regulations could be interpreted in such a manner. Uh, in that process, there was the HUD field office was reviewing and the state agency was reviewing, and my memory of this, as best as I can remember, this was bogged down. Somehow no one was looking at the, the opinion. It was just, oh, we've never done this before. In order to Isn't it true that the field office repeatedly denied the request That's for correct. rent increase? That is correct. And isn't that why you were called in to have the central office overrule the field no, office? No, I, I believe I've, this is a client that I've represented since I'm first coming out into private practice, mm -hmm. so it, it wasn't just for, for this. I, I maintain a constant relationship with this client. Did you succeed in having the central office overrule the field office? My memory without looking at it is we got, based on that memo, a partial success. Did Ms. Dean play a role in that? Yes, she did. What role did she play? We had a, when we had gotten bogged down and we couldn't get a decision, and I believe this is in the interim when there was no assistant secretary, um, we couldn't get a decision from the field office. We wanted the project to be worked on for somebody who, had, who was more experienced. When you work in HUD Central, just for a point, you get to see a microcosm of the world. So you see everybody's problem under a particular reg. So they're very knowledgeable people. We wanted them to take a look at that in HUD Central based on this legal opinion so we could get some resolution because we were just stalled. Do you think that your relationship with Ms. Dean had anything to do with the favorable resolution? I think Debbie's help in this matter uh, did help us resolve this. What work did you perform for Benton Mortgage? Uh, I have been their closing attorney and have represented them since 1982. What was your involvement with the Durham Hosiery Mill project, Ms. Murphy? Um, Mr. D Since this has been discussed before the committee, I feel that the attorney-client privilege has been waived, and I have talked about this to my client, yes. not in particular. Um, I became involved in the Durham Hosiery Mill, I have to say, around 1983. Um, and I don't know, I think Mr. Allen was recommended to me by another attorney. Um, he had a project that had been, that was a complicated project that I had heard about when I was in HUD. I had never had anything to do with it, but I had heard about it. Uh, he asked my advice. Um, I subsequently had an associate prepare several memorandum on how this project could be financed. Uh, we later served as bond counsel uh, in this project. Congressman Shays.
been somewhat explored, your relationship with Deborah Gordine, but I just want to uh, be very clear. Uh, you are very close friends, correct? We are friends. You are very close friends. Is that we are not good friends, and I count her among the dozen or so good friends I have. Well, uh, in other words, so she's just one of a number of good friends you have. That's correct. Uh, how many good friends do you have that are, let me ask you this, is she the godmother of any of your children? No. She's not? No. Okay. Why are you smiling? It's just a, an odd question. Okay. I'm sorry. No, it's not an odd question because someone said you were, so I wanted to ask the question. Okay. Um, with the, uh, is your husband work for the Winston Company? No, he does not. He did work for them. Okay. Uh, did the Winston Company ever get involved in any HUD-related activities? Uh, in, I can't remember the date because I was not involved. Um, the Winston Network offered on transit advertising uh, space for public service message. And uh, at that time, the department had mounted a fair housing campaign, and they had donated the space on their, on their buses in the various cities around the country. Who was in charge of that fair housing campaign? Deborah Gordine. What was the value of the contribution of the Winston Company? I have no idea, sir. You have no idea? Uh, that is my husband's business. He's no longer with something. that company. You said you have no idea. You I don't have, have no any idea. idea. Could have been a hundred. It could have been a million. You don't know. I just simply wasn't involved in what they were doing. Okay. Would you please, uh, for this committee, uh, provide us information as to the amount of value that the Winston Group uh, provided to HUD? Something you can do for us? Um, what I can do, the Winston Group has been sold since then. My husband is no longer employed. I can, I certainly will but endeavor you, to get this. Don't you think your husband would know it? Okay. Um, I, let me think about that. I'll talk to my husband and get back to you. You know why I'm asking the question? Do you see any logic to the question? You are a close friend of Deborah Gordine. You are such a friend that you can meet in her office you said, uh, and, and get advanced uh, a look at a letter. You say that you periodically go out and, and, and have meals with her and, and have associations with her. And she is in charge of a project. She's in charge of this road show that goes around the country. That's her big project. And you, a friend, uh, help uh, her husband provide, your husband provides a significant benefit uh, to this effort. Was there any quid pro quo for that benefit? Not that I know of. Okay. Was she grateful that your husband had uh, provided her that benefit? I have to tell you, that, um, my relationship with Debbie is through my Deborah is through my husband John. They have a relationship. Mm -hmm. I was not involved in this campaign at all. Mm -hmm. But you had a lot of dealings with HUD. You called yourself the HUD attorney. Is that not correct? That is correct. Yeah. Uh, what what projects did you do at HUD that um, were based on uh, so many dollars per unit, 1,200 per unit. What other projects did you do for HUD where you charged that type of, had that kind of arrangement? I'm sorry, Mr. Shays. Could we be sp more specific? Yeah, I, You're I, asking me in the time when Debbie Gordine no, was no, I didn't ask e you that. EA. I, no, I asked you. You have an arrangement and you talk, to act like this was very from. You first have told us you had no idea that the going rate was 1000 to $2,000 in the street. That's your testimony, and you have to stand by that. No, I said I had no knowledge of it. Yeah, you had no knowledge that that, that was the rate. But it just was a coincidence that you charged pretty much in between the 1000 to 2000 which everybody else knew on the street was being charged. And it just so happens that you have a relationship or your husband has a friendship with Deborah Gordine, who's the major player in deciding who gets mod rehab projects. So you are someone who uh, it would be wise to hire because you have a special advantage that some other people don't have. And you were able, it seems to me, uh, in this project, did this project go through the pro San Francisco housing project, the 230 units went no, through? No, this project, when we got back to the client, when we did the analysis, this project is going to have to, if it's ever to be done, will have to be done with some sort of a uh, flexible subsidy, some sort of workout project, some sort of the city of San Francisco. There's nothing available in, in a lot of the HUD tools um, to fix this project without massive effort. And my research on this indicated that this project was considered in a very bad light, and this was going to take a long time and to, to, to do. Not as an attorney, but as a consultant. 
uh, you established a contract for $1,200 per unit. Did you have any other types of contracts with any other groups for mod rehab units where you charge this type of, had this kind of arrangement? I would have to go back through my records, but we do have contracts with other groups. Yes, we do. You know, here we go again. I mean, you no, know. Uh, the answer is yes, I can I ask do. for the specifics, uh, but well, the, the answer is yes. I'll be glad to provide those contracts. The answer is yes. Some must come to mind. Give me a, a list of some of the others that to come to mind. You know, if, if I have to tell you, right now, we're currently not working on any. Um, that's irrelevant to me. Okay. Uh, in the last... Since you left HUD, have you had any... Have you, have you been working on any projects, mod rehab projects, in which you charge your clients a contingency fee, like 1000 per unit or 500 per unit? Okay. We have... And I'm not being invasive, Mr. Shays. Believe me. I can go back through my beginning. I have financed projects with mod rehab units where I have charged as co bond counsel, underwriters counsel, contingent. No, you I have, uh, please, uh, let me finish. I, I have charged as solely a mod rehab consultant where the fees have been contingent. I have solved That's the one I want. That's the one I'm interested oh. in. I mean, one does not forget, uh, unless you are an extraordinarily wealthy person, one does not forget a fee of $1,000 per unit, especially when maybe you've succeeded. Because if you succeeded in this project, uh, your income would be well over $200,000. So I am assuming that you will remember some of these. Can you give me a list of those that you remember now and supply me with those that you don't remember? Uh, what I'm on. trying to say is, when we went back over this, is for example, I can remember financing a mod rehab pro project where I was bond counsel and underwriting counsel. The fees were contingent. I seriously do not know. We charged, in that looking at it, we charged as a, a percentage of the deal uh, of the financing. I simply don't know. I will be glad to go oh, back no, through not, my we're records not, we're not gonna and, provide, and provide that to the committee. We're not going to stop here because it defies logic. You have told the chairman that this is a standard way that you charge and this is nothing unusual and because of all the work involved in the history and you've done projects like this before so you have every reason to be able to tell us another project just give me one other project like this or I'm going to assume that you don't have any no you cannot assume that well then you're going to have to be a little more cooperative with us we're going to have to go back for example um, each fee over the years has been negotiated on its own. This contract was approved by HUD in 1988. It's when we started using this contract. Okay. Let me just be clear on this. This is very helpful. You said uh, this is a, uh, a, f a contract that you've, you've had approved from HUD since when? I believe it was early 1988. The letter is October 28, 1988. Okay. And so... I will be glad to, to no, don't, provide don't. this to the committee. No, no. We have let's, let's get to it file. now. Let's get to it now. You said that this is a, a new contract. Who? Uh, this is based on the ruling of David, uh, a memorandum from David White. Is this? Is this basically on on how you charge as a consultant? Mr. Shays, may I see it? Yeah. Let me ask you before I ask before you do not have any recollection of a memorandum from David White or any. We won't even go on it. No, not I'm, even, I'm no, saying no, I would no, like to not, see you what you're holding no, up. No, you don't. I, I won't even ask the question because we have so many important things that we're going to get to here. I am going to ask you again, and I would like you to cooperate, please. Do you recall having any other contracts like the contract you had with San Francisco Housing Project? Well, this had 230 units where you charged 1000 or or $1,200 a unit. Do you recall any other contracts like that? Yes, I do. Okay, what are they? They're in, uh, I'd have to go back because none of them have come to execution because it's 1988. Do you have any started, that have come to execution? We have the, we have, none of these have come to fruition. So y your testimony is that there may be, there are some, but none of them have come to fruition. That, what I want to say to you, yes, this former contract, this contract was approved in 1988 and we began By who? To use it by David White. Well, see, why did I have to show that to you? Because then? I'm not sure what you've got there. Well, no, you tell me. What did David White do? I won't even show you anything. Tell me what David my White did. My memory approved. of what we got from what my partner got from uh, Mr. White was a sample uh, agreement with a cover letter that says this has been approved by the Government Office of Ethics, blah, blah, blah. So you're telling us that, that HUD was actually going out and telling you 
uh, that you could charge a con on a contingency basis and provide you a document that you could, you could uh, um, pretty much uh, use as a model. Is that correct? Mr. Chase, they didn't provide it. We submitted it. We were concerned as lawyers, we were concerned where the line was. We went to HUD and said, is this okay? We do this in contingent fee in our bond work, in our underwriting why, why work. Why would you have done that? I don't understand because why you... Because this was something involving government programs. It was something we were concerned as lawyers. We looked at it so and said, then this is close, and let's go find out about before it. Then, before then... We think it's okay, but I want to be sure. Before then, you never had uh, contingency fees because uh, obviously... You didn't want to do it until you knew it was okay. So I'm assuming that before uh, you got that memorandum from Mr. White, you chose not to do contracts like that? No, we did not do contracts like that. We yes. did contracts similar to this, but this one was approved. Okay, we did, similar let means me, what? Let me go back. We, what my point was is we've said we have charged contingency fees and deals, and I can name a myriad of most, a lot of them bond deals. Some of them involve subsidies, some do not. May I please say something to you? Yes. I don't want to talk about bonds. I want to talk about housing. I want to talk about mod rehab, and I am tired of you continually bringing up bonds. Just talk to me about what we're here to discuss. Mod rehab, getting units, the real estate side, the consultant side. Did you do any contracts uh, based on a contingency for mod rehab, uh, 202, you name it? Prior to 1988, I do not remember having any, I do not recall having any contingency fee contracts. Okay. Then why would you say to our chairman that you knew the work that would be involved and you've done this kind of work before and these are the kinds of fees you charge? Because I likened it to other projects that we have worked in. But, but you have not done other mod rehab projects before? I didn't say that. You well, said, I'm asking I... that. Right. I'm asking, have you done any mod rehab projects yes, before? Yes, I have. Did you charge contingency fees on mod rehab projects before? You are a very evasive witness. I am not trying to be evasive, but I've got an expertise here. Can I try to narrow this? If you're saying as if we went in and were paid, and, and bear with me for a little bit, on a project that had mod rehab and we were paid from the beginning to the end a contingency fee, yes. Tell me the projects. The project you have in front of you, Church Hill. And, and how much did you earn? I was paid $80,000. Okay. Did you have any others? You were a, a HUD consultant for a long time. I, she, I, that's correct. And, and that's it correct. just it defies logic that you wouldn't be able to tell me a number. But Mr. Shays, you've got to remind, my practice is in this area. And it is all phases. Your question is much too broad for no, but, me to but respond. You can, you can get out the phases that I'm not interested in. I'm not talking about bonding anymore. Well, I'm that, talking about mod rehab. All right, tell I'm me talking about getting units for public housing authorities and getting the central office to approve them. I'm I, talking about your incredible connections to the central office. Mm -hmm. Now, you've told the chairman that you did this, you charged this fee because you've done work like this before, like this before, and this, you figured this is pretty much what's it's, what it's going to cost you. Now, before you went to Mr. White and you asked to see this memo, memorandum, I don't even need to see it either because you know about it and I know about it. Uh, you're the one who told me about it, and yet you wanted to see it. Uh, can you please tell me if you had any other contingency arrangements where you got 500 a unit, 1,000 a unit, or more? Did you have any others? If your question, and I have to rephrase it, and I'm not being evasive, sir. If your question is, did I have contingency fees that I could go back and calculate them out of, on a per unit basis, yes. Did, okay. you ever, did you ever bill a client based on a per unit basis? The fees were worked out in advance. They weren't billed on per unit. They'd be a so set the answer fee. is no, you didn't. Isn't, is that the answer? The answer would be no, except at the time you go into this project, you... No, but, that, but I, I don't you care to know your pay. logic. I don't care to know your logic. I asked if you had any contracts where you got so much per unit. And I'm telling you, sir, we didn't have any contracts answer is, so you did to not. this period, but we did have arrangements with people where when we went in and worked with them, we said we will get paid approximately X, and that may or may not have approximated what it was going to be at the end. And it was based on a contingency? It was based on a contingency. Okay, so the answer is, it's the first time that you basically said, 
we are going to get so many per unit. So your response, to, is that not true? My answer, in some cases they were not calculated on a per unit basis. I will ask this once more time. Did you have any contract before this one, October 28, 1988, before this contract, where you were paid on a per unit basis? It's a simple okay. question. And I wish me, I could ask me, it let like me go the chairman back, asked, because he'd I, get I, an answer. I didn't say that. I said, yes, I have many contracts like this. But these contracts have, have not been executed. It's just it's in the development phase. I have not been paid on. But yes, I do have other contracts like this. What's the earliest contract that you have? I would have to go and check my records, and I will, Mr. Shea. No, I, I'm going to say, Mr. Chairman, and there are a number of other questions I want to ask. I would like you to provide for us, and I would make a request to this to you now as as the chairman to ask her to come back in when she has this information. Because I, I have to tell you that, that I think that you can answer the question now or you can answer it later. What I would like is I would like to know every HUD project you have been involved in. And don't look so surprised. I'd like to know every HUD project you've been involved in. If you were, had been more cooperative, I would not be asking this. Mr. Shays, I'm attempting to cooperate. And, and no. please, I'm a precise attorney. I am trying to be precise. Every sure. project I've been involved in is my practice. You know I'm what? a HUD attorney. You're a, you're a consultant and you're making money off the system because of your relationships. And you can call yourself a HUD attorney all you want. You're charging contingency fees. You're no different than Mr. Watt, except you knew Deborah Gordine better. That's the difference. And you cashed in on your, on your previous arrangement with HUD. That's the way I feel about it. Now, I would like to know, I would like this committee to request that you provide us all the HUD projects you had worked on, and I would like to know how many, uh, what you made from these projects. I'd like to know the name of the developers, if you worked with any developers. Uh, so the names of these projects, where they were located. I'd like to know um, uh, how much money you charged, how much money your firm charged for these. And um, we'll take a look at this information. Uh, and not just Mod Rehab, but any other HUD project. Mm -hmm. Because I think, very honestly, that uh, there's a big story that you have to tell, and, uh, and maybe you'll be able to tell it better when you get this information. Now, I'd like to... Um, Would the gentleman ye sure. yield yes. just in, in line with this? I'm not giving up. Because we do have a lot of... I mean, what's a lawyer and what's a consultant? And, you know, if it uh, looks like a consultant, smells like a consultant, acts like a consultant, you can call it a lawyer all you want. It seems to us it's a consultant. I would like to ask a question. On, in your present firm, or in any previous firm, were there any arrangements whereby you were paid as a consultant and the money did not go to the law firm, but went to you or a subgroup of the people in the law firm as consultants? Okay. Um, to my knowledge, um, prior to 19, September 1985, I was an attorney in a law firm. Um, I have no memory or no recollection that any fee ever came to me during that period of time directly. What's the uh, name of that firm? Denell's Duval Bennett and Porter. Uh, since 1985, in my present firm, the money would come into the firm, and the money would be apportioned to me in total. In total. In total, except for my. Was it a, was there a separate entity? I have had separate entities with different people at different times. In but the present firm. In the present firm. You just said in your present firm the money would come directly to you, straight? No, we, I have had partnerships uh, in, with other people working on projects with me. Yes, I have. And the money, if a check came from the developer, it would not be made out to the law firm, but would be made out to this separate entity? That's correct. And the firm's, ex how would the entity reimburse the firm for its expenses? They would cut a check to the firm. To the firm. To me. Is that, ha is that, was that, done because you were a consultant? No, it was basically that people would not be members of the firm. It's people who I'd be working with. I don't understand that. Well, some, in certain instances, for me, I would be working with a group of people who we would all be working on one project to one event. A group uh, and, of and, people. And, these are non-lawyers? These are, no, these are all lawyers. Lawyers, but lawyers not of the firm? That's right. And in that instance, I can only remember one instance in that, and I'd have to go back and check my records. 
but the money would go directly to you. It would go to me. And avoid the law firm. No, it would go into the law firm. If it went to me, it went into the law firm. So then all the money that you received in this capacity you, was, would go into the law firm, That's every nickel of That's it. That's correct. And why, why did it go to you then? Why couldn't it just go to the law firm? You know, we had another lawyer who was a housing expert testify a week ago, mm -hmm. Carla Hills. And I think the general view of the, of the committee, certainly my view, was that she was doing, trying to do a good job and an honorable job. She worked for a law firm. She was paid a certain amount per hour. There were no contingency fees. The amount was not excessive. She worked hundreds of hours and got $35,000. Everything here smacks of some totally different arrangement. And I don't understand why, if, if the money was all going to the law firm, why you would need a separate entity so that money would be paid directly to you. And particularly if it was what legal work for which you were being paid. Well, I but answer the first question. Why would the money have to go to you okay. instead of going to the law well, firm? It, if it went to me, it went to the law firm. I mean, why, didn't the check the check, why wasn't the check cut out to the law firm? Because in um, working with these people, it was uh, my manner Wait, of working with, working with developers. If the developer engaged, for example, myself, the money would be in the law firm. If, the, uh, if I was putting a series of people working together with me, then it would be in one of these entities. And then the check would become from the entity to the law firm. I'll pursue some more later. I thank oh. the gentleman for you. Uh, I'm not going to pursue the financial arrangements. I'll just wait to, to get information from you and your attorney about it, and then we'll proceed from there. Uh, I would like to ask you a, a question about your relationship with Benton Mortgage Company. Uh, what was your responsibilities at Benton Mortgage Company? What were you doing for Benton Mortgage Company? Um, well, since 1982, I represented them as legislative counsel, doing all sorts of work legislatively on the Hill and the tax acts. Now, let me ask you something. Did you, uh, were you, ever, did you ever have a position there? No, I did not. Okay. Yeah. Uh, were you compensated with salary? You were not, were you no, I was always acting as their attorney or the legislative counsel or in that capacity. So your testimony is that basically you, you represented them as an attorney. That's correct. Um, uh, you had that same type of relationship with DRG? Yes, that's correct. Let me ask you, I, it's hard for me to, to understand. They're basically competitors, uh, it seems to me. How, isn't there a, a potential conflict? No, it's like representing a bond closing, and I know you don't want to hear uh, representing two underwriters. No, this is I, different. Now we're talking about a financial no. arrangement. We're talking about your work as a lawyer, not as no. a consultant. No. So, um, uh, but they were competitors, clearly. They were competitors. Um, and they both were in financial, they both were, had financial problems and they both had to work out their relationship problems with uh, HUD. Is that not correct? I don't know. I did not represent, I do not represent Benton in that, in any endeavors to work out anything with HUD. And I do not know if they have financial problems. Um, I just, w w because I know we have two members who have some important questions to ask you. Uh, would you tell me your relationship with uh, Michael uh, Karam, wh what kind of work you, you've done with him? I've done no work with Michael Karam. Okay. Michael Karam, you've had no work. He was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multifamily, but you've had no, you never had contact with him. How about Hunter Cushing? Did you have any relationship with uh, Michael Karam? No. I, Michael Karam, let me go back because I named him as one of the people who was in, one of the, was one of the revolving people who went through dis Deputy Assistant Secretary. I've never worked with him after he left the department. Um, Hunter Cushing? Yes, I know Hunter. Okay, tell me, how do you know Hunter? I know him in his capacity as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multifamily Housing. And, and you worked with him? I've worked with Hunter. See, both, um, both Hunter uh, Cushing and, and uh, for in multifamily, you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and also Michael Karam worked in multifamily. Were they involved in, in some of the draft of that letter that we've referred to, the letter of the, of the 9th, of the 10th? May 10th? I'd, I'd have to look at the concurrence sheet, but if, if I don't know who was in place at the time, I would think it was Hunter was in place. I don't know who was in place at, uh, at the Let time. Let me ask you as, a, as my final range of questions. Have you ever hired, uh, and if so, who and when, uh, former HUD employees to do work for you? Okay. As an attorney, I hired, uh, my law firm hired Monica Sussman, who used to work for me at HUD. Mm -hmm. um, I hired... Deborah Gordine in May of 1988 to do work for me. 
And I'm asking you how much you paid Deborah? I paid her twenty five hundred a month and a retainer of five thousand. Now, um, a cynic, which I haven't yet become, uh, would say that uh, one way that um, uh, let me ask you, why did you hire her? Um, it was May of 1988. Um, this is after she left? Uh, yes, she was still under her one-year bar. And she needed a job? She, well, I don't know whether she needed a job, but she certainly um, uh, wasn't pleasant giving me information when I was calling her all the time asking for it. Um, I, I was, don't understand what you just said. Uh, basically, um, I talked to Debbie on an occasional basis about issues that I was, what were the policies, what things were this coming up. This is when she worked for HUD? No, this is after she came out and was starting up her business, Dean and Associates. Yeah, okay. 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 Um, in that context, in May of 1988, I had greatly slowed down, uh, was trying to handle my workload, my client workload, plus maintain on the cutting edge of all the information, et cetera, that was coming out of HUD. So how long had she been away from HUD? By the time? She was out of HUD. Um, I'd have to say she, we attached a copy of her barman because I knew she was under the bar. Um, not, she couldn't, the one year you cannot go back in. Um, I believe she was out seven or eight months. Okay, I'm confused by that. She can't, she's got to separate herself for a year from HUD involvement. M my understanding, and I, I'll have to. But, but she can work for you, who's a HUD attorney. That's correct. Yeah, how does that work? I mean, well, she's logic. not representing a client before HUD. And that's the, the purpose of the barm is the revolving door not to go back in a year after you're out. See, that, this is the cynic that, that, that is coming out in me, but um, I'm beginning to feel, where's the quid pro quo? And I'm beginning to see uh, uh, where I think I see it. And that is um, you do a favor for people and then later on they do a favor for you. And you did one big favor for her. You hired her uh, shortly after she was out. She didn't even have a year before she wasn't supposed to do HUD work or represent clients, but you represented clients before HUD and you hire her. And, um, uh, and you took care of her, it strikes me. And doesn't it strike you as inappropriate that you should have hired her so soon afterwards? No, at that time I was desperately in need of her services. I bet you were. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congressman Weiss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to go back to the uh, Pierce nine-page letter that the Chairman asked you about early on. And you had said that it didn't really come as a, as a surprise to you that there would be such a contradiction between the stern indictment and the conclusion because, in fact, you'd been aware of the development of that letter over a period of time. Is that an accurate restatement of, of, of what your testimony was? I believe I said I was aware of the issues that are arising in this, um, this pre-commitment review. As, yes. As had, you, had you seen earlier versions of the letter? I don't recall having seen earlier versions. Had, may you have seen earlier? No. Might you have seen earlier no, versions? I don't, I don't think so. Don't had you... What, before you perused the letter, the, the, the final draft, that is without the, the signature of the secretary, but after everybody else seemed to have signed off on it within the agency, uh, had you known what the conclusion of that letter was going to be? Yes. How long before you saw that draft or perused that draft did you know what the conclusion was going to be? Mr. Congressman, um, I only know that in the process of working out all these pre-commitment reviews, and I, I wasn't representing DRG at the time, that uh, there were uh, reasons to believe there were not that many discrepancies as seen between the underwriting um, that DRG was doing and the underwriting that HUD was doing because a majority of the projects were approved at the same loan amounts that went in. So given that, um, I had assumed that if you've gone through HUD pre-commitment review and they've been approved and they come out looking the same, it would be logical that you would now um, let them start underwriting on their own after having gone through this as a learning process. 
And I believe York was doing the same thing, although I wasn't intimately involved with what was happening with York's pre-commitment review. Well, that, that, that's a nice long way around of not answering my question. On May 10, there's a letter dated May 10, 1985. Sometime, that's, that's the date on which Secretary Pierce signs the letter which you get to peruse before that date. Exactly what the date is. Do you know how many days before you peruse that letter before May 10th? No, I don't know. Uh, was I, it, I, my impression was it was going out the door. So that it was that day, the day before, very close on. That's my impression. Okay. And you say that sometime, that you knew the conclusion prior to the day that you looked at the, at, at the, at the, that per, you perused that May 10th letter. Right. I had been Okay. And the question that I asked you is how long prior to May 10th or the day that you perused this letter had you known what the conclusion of the May 10th letter was? I, I can't even, uh, I'd have to go back. Um, we were only representing one client. Um, I don't know how long it would be. Uh, would it be a week? I don't know when they, how many deal, how many loans were approved in their current status at what time. I am simply wasn't involved in that process. Was it a month? I don't know. Well, was it, was the, what, is, it, is it a fact that the reason that you perused that letter was not because you were really concerned about the stern indictment and the inartful way in which it was drawn, but that you were really concerned about bottom line? You wanted to be sure that the conclusion of that final letter was the same as the conclusion that you had learned about earlier. Isn't that correct? Um, if your question is, was I concerned that what I thought was coming out was coming out? Right. Yes. Okay. Now. You, you had testified in response to a question, or maybe you even offered in your narrative, that you, your firm represented uh, DRG uh, commencing sometime in September of 1985. Is that that's, correct? That's correct. Now, had you represented DRG, at, that, or your firm represented DRG at any time prior to September of 1985? The... Um no, my firm was formed in September 1985. My previous firm represented this developer that was in the pre one of his loan was in this process. Did that, did that previous firm represent DRG? Um, my understanding is that they did not and were not paid by DRG for work on this on this this Okay. Series. Now, the question that I have of you is whether you think that it is, in fact, appropriate for an attorney who does not represent the firm which is the subject of that letter, the, the Pierce letter, uh, and is not employed by HUD, to read that letter prior to it becoming an official public document. Do you think that's appropriate? I don't think HUD was violating any confidence. So Never I don't mind think it, HUD. I don't think it was inappropriate because um, because I wasn't represented DRG at that time. I mean, I was there with the, you know, it wasn't a secret. I was involved in this kind of getting these, these loans out. It wasn't an antagonistic relationship at all. It was information that was, we've already established, was very important confidential information. It was important consequential information. What, what the Secretary decided, what HUD decided, would be very important for the client whom your firm represented, which was not DRG. We've established that, correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, here comes a letter of which your firm, the, firm that, the company that your firm is representing, is not the subject. It is not directed to them. And you, a stranger to DRG at that point, a stranger to DRG, comes in and looks at that letter before it becomes final, before it's signed by the secretary. And I ask you again whether you think that that's appropriate conduct. 
Mr. Weiss, we were not strangers to DRG. We were working with DRG and the developer trying to get this project loan out. No, no, wait a minute. And when this Will you letter... Hold, hold it, hold it, hold it. Stop it. Let me stop you right there. Up to this point, you have been insisting constantly and consistently that, in fact, you, in your individual capacity, nor the firm that you worked for at that time, represented DRG in any capacity at all. That's correct. That, the, that the, the person you represented was somebody who wanted a loan from DRG, right? Correct. Okay. Now, again, in a legal relationship sense, you and your firm are strangers to DRG. You say, certainly are. Now, I, again, I don't, I don't know where you learned your ethics from. But it seems to me that your course of conduct in that situation is totally inappropriate. And yes. I think the course of conduct of those people who allow you to see that kind of letter, knowing that you have no relationship with the firm at all, is totally inappropriate. Mr. Wise, I agree if I were a stranger to DRG, but in the context of, the, of our employment for the client, we were over with the client, with DRG, trying to understand what were the problems with DRG so we could get this one loan out. I mean, it wasn't that we were not strangers. My partner, who I was working with, was working hand in hand with the developer, with DRG, in order for them to both benefit. But we were representing and paid by, I believe, the, um, the client. So we weren't strangers. This was you, a were, you were being paid for by the client who was not DRG. Right, but this was a joint effort. DRG at that time would look for any help it got. Um, and we were representing to the extent we could work and try to move this project and the extent move the process now, supposing, along. Supposing it was somebody who represented a competitor of DRG, supposing it was York, who, wanted, who sent a lawyer in to HUD and said, we're interested in knowing what that letter to DRG is going to say. And, D and HUD, in fact, showed DRG's competitor what that letter was going to be. Would that have been appropriate conduct? No, sir, that would not It be. would not have been appropriate conduct, that's right either on the part of the attorney who sought that information or HUD in supplying that information. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Okay, and I don't see where you are in any different position. Now, let me ask you, after Ms. Hills, when, he, when she testified before us, testified that when she read that harsh or stern indictment in the Pierce letter, uh, told DRG through its officers, that they were given one last shot, that they had really better behave themselves and conduct themselves appropriately because the secretary quite clearly was saying, this is it. Now, she then dropped out of the picture and in September, retains you. Now, do you at that point have any discussion or even before September, do you have any discussions with DRG about responding to the Pierce letter? Um, Mr. Wise, I don't remember having any discussions to it. I know DRG uh, did do a response. I don't remember having discussions on it. I wasn't familiar with the whole history of DRG at that time. Now, when, when you retain, when you are retained by DRG, at that point, I assume you bring yourself up to speed on what's been happening, and you become familiar. Is that right? I become familiar with certain of the problems they're facing. We weren't familiar, of course, with the underwriting, and no one can speak for that except DRG, I think. You, you become familiar with the problems that DRG is having with HUD. Is that correct? Right. Okay. Now, do you at that point see a letter? Do you recollect seeing a, a letter from DRG to HUD contesting or responding to the Pierce letter. Yes, I do remember seeing a letter. And when, when was that letter dated and what did that letter say? I do not know. Uh, I, don't, I just don't know, but I do know there was a response. 
do you have a discussion at that point with DORG as to what their further response ought to be or what response they've received from HUD in response to their response? I wasn't familiar with background and everything with DOG. I don't remember having that co a conversation like that. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't remember. What, what do you mean you weren't familiar with background? You just, you just gotten through telling us how it was perfectly appropriate for you to see the Pierce letter beca before it became public because of your involvement with this client who was trying to get That's a loan correct. from DRG. That's correct. So that indeed you were familiar with the problems what that DRG was having. Isn't that correct? Yeah, yes, I was familiar with the general the specifics, never mind the general, the specific problems that DRG was having with HUD. You were familiar with that. I was familiar with the problems that were set out in that letter. You bet. Okay. Now, what about the response that DRG gave to HUD to that letter? Uh, I don't recollect having any, put into, any input into that letter. I know you, you said that, but you, don't, you may have or you just simply don't recall. I simply don't recall. But you may have. I may have. I okay. Now, do you recollect what that response was? Uh, my recollection of that letter was they were disputing um, some of the findings, and the one issue that jumps out to me was, I think there was something in the uh, May 9th letter, if I recall, that said um, that um, you didn't use appropriate personnel, they weren't HUD approved, and I remember a response going in that clipped the approval letter on back. I think I do. I'm not quite sure if it was this or something else. Now, so. there, there comes a time shortly, very shortly, before that year is out, that uh, HUD, that DRG starts having problems uh, with, with the colonial apartments. Is that correct? I believe they were having problems prior to that. Uh, well, what was, what was your firm's role? in regard to colonial apartments as of the time and subsequent to your retainer in September of 85? Okay. When we were retained in 85, um, DRG was in the process of working out uh, a workout proposal with the owner and various uh, bond council and people who were involved in that. Um, I was one of the team of attorneys that represented DRG in negotiation with the team of attorneys um, who we were trying to hammer out an agreement on on the workout for Colonial House. And during all of this time, what happens to uh, DRG's capacity to grant loans? I, I simply don't know. I assume they were um, making loans. Um, they were released from pre-commitment at that time, so I'm assuming they were making loans at that time. And even though a workout situation develops with DRG, because it, it has a default situation on its hands, uh, HUD continues to allow, they're, they're granting loans without a preclearance process. Is that right? That's right. And does HUD at any time follow up and communicate with DRG and say, listen, on the basis of your performance, uh, and the letter that Secretary Pierce sent to you, we're revoking your right to issue loans and we're reinstating the preclearance. Does that happen at any stage? Yes, it does. When does that happen? I can't recall the date, Congressman, but it was, um, I'd say, a year or so later. I can get you... Um, a year or so later, meaning like in ninth, late 1986? Well, there was a series of HUD reviews. They did an on-site monitoring vis visit um, and they, I think there were, uh, in that monitoring visit, there were uh, deficiencies noted. I don't know whether it was at that time or some later time. And is it, is it your sense that, uh, that uh, HUD's treatment of DRG during that time frame between the time that you, your firm was retained by DRG and the time that they revoked the, uh, the, uh, uh, pre, the, the post-clearance, the post-loan monitoring situation, uh, that the course of conduct of HUD and DRG was a proper one? Yes, I do. I mean, as far as I know, it was. Um, if, I, I think I'm, I'm not quite understanding your question. 
Well, I given, given, I the, given the, the fact that, as the chairman alluded to it, something like $530 million of taxpayers' funds are at likely risk at this point because of DRG's loan practices uh, and the Inspector General's conclusion that uh, a vast percentage of DRG's loans, in fact, are going bad, whereas only about 2 or 3 percent of York's are going bad. Do you believe that HUD did an appropriate job of monitoring the, uh, the work of DRG? I think if the actions they were supposed to have taken and DRG was supposed to have taken, there were, there were all sorts of reports going back and forth. I would say HUD did its best efforts to monitor, but considering the outcome of this, where there is so many defaults, the answer would have to be no, Congressman. And you, but you didn't believe, you didn't feel that as it was happening? I, I wasn't knowledgeable. I mean, what I saw was a company who was trying to work out, was trying to stay in the business. It was better for the government to keep them in business because they wouldn't have the whole um, uh, co-insurance loss. Um, it was in the benefit of the, uh, the government to keep them going. And in fact, I do believe out of its own pockets, DRG advanced $20 million of its own funds. Lots of luck compared to what the loss is to the taxpayers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, tell me, you had, you had said that the Church Hill Richmond Virginia project was a, was one of the, was a contingency project in response to a question that Mr. Shays had asked you. How many units were involved in that project? Oh, between 140 and 160. And you ha and what was the total amount that was paid to your firm uh, on the, for for that project? Um, Eighty thousand dollars. That was the grand total. That was the total amount paid to the firm. Okay. So that in that one, the the going rate was somewhere close to five hundred dollars a unit. Is that right? Has that money been collected? Was the 80000 collected? Yes, it has. And did you, did you have a, uh, uh, a billing sheet which spelled out number of hours and the amount of work that no, was done and we so do. on? On transactional work, we do not bill the client based on hours. This was done on transactional. So that again, I mean, you, you made a face when I said it was, on, it was, it was about $500, $600 a unit. But in fact, it was done on a, on a, on a per-unit basis. Isn't that correct? Um, yes, it was. Thank you. Uh, and finally, I want to get back again to the uh, agreement that you had with, with Mr. Rosé of the Associated Finance Corporation and want to be very clear as to what your testimony is. And let me start by referring to the memorandum for David White, Assistant General Counsel, Administrative Law, uh, subject consultant from Betty Park, Acting Assistant General Counsel, subject consultant agreement section eight and mod rehab. Now, this talks about contingent fee consultant agreements. Isn't that? I'm sorry. This memorandum on which you relied on getting into an ag the agreement that you entered into with Mr. Rosé regard to San Francisco housing project refers to contingent fee consultant agreements. Isn't that correct? Yes. It doesn't, it doesn't talk about legal retainers. No, it does not. It's about consultant agreements. And it's that, it's that opinion that you received from HUD when you asked as to whether your relationship, uh, your, your, your fee arrangement with Bruce Rosé was in fact a, a uh, legal one, appropriate one, a valid one. Is that correct? That's correct. This, this, uh, yes, that's correct. So that, again, I will ask you, when you signed the agreement on October 28, 1988, which reduced to writing your oral understanding that Barrett, Montgomery, and Murphy, Perrin Associates, is willing to act as a financial and real estate consultant to Associated Finance Corporation, Perrin Client, 
and then it goes on, that you were acting, you were, you were agreeing to act as an attorney, as a, in an attorney-client relationship or in a consultant relationship? We've, we've been through this. Um, and I'd like your answer for I the know, record to be I know, but we believe clear. the type of work that we were doing at the time in, the, in, in the making an analysis of this project, and we did do that. I mean, we did take the retainer. We did count it against ours. We did determine that, first of all, ab admissio, this was not eligible for any of the subsidy programs that HUD had. Um, it just, it has um, rental rehab, which is eliminated. No, I heard you say all okay. of that. I'm, but I'm the work we you. performed was legal work. Was legal work. That is correct. Now, I assume that you have a set uh, retainer form that your firm uses with for new clients. Do you? Yes, we do. And tell us what the opening paragraph of that, of, of that stock retainer form says. Well, I would probably say we, we agree to represent you, blah, 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 blah. I mean. Uh, and, and, and or, or you hereby agree to retain us as your counsel, That's right? That's correct. That's correct. This doesn't say anything like that. that. Is that right? That is correct. This, this talks only about you as a consultant. Isn't that correct? The opening paragraph says we, we went through this, talks about us in that capacity. But when you look at it, the research on regulations, uh, the analysis, and which is what the work we did was. Well, it, it was says again, it, again, if, if I may, it says on paragraph two, in our capacity as consultant, associates will review properties, analyze various development alternatives, advise client of the most advantageous options, including financing, and utilization of federal and state, local, and programs. Uh, associates will also provide, upon request, research on regulations, advice regarding legislation, assistance in the acquisition, financing, and rehabilitation of rental housing. Now, then it goes on, representatives of associates will devote all time reasonably necessary to provide the foregoing consulting services over the next 10 months, and then in the next paragraph says, client will reimburse associates uh, for all out-of-pocket costs in the performance of its consulting services. I just, I must tell you, I don't know how you can transform that consultant's contract into a legal fee retainer. I don't know how you can do it. And I, again, I, I'm, I, I would think that you would have trouble in rationalizing that before anybody, not just before this subcommittee. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank Thank you very much. Congressman Shays. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Schumer wanted me to put on the record two points and to ask the witness a a question in regards to one of these points. Um, First, he uh, wanted to put on the record in response to a question I asked about the cost of the Fair Housing Roadshow, and you said you had no idea. According to Deborah Gordine, in a statement to the IG, she said, in conversations with me, John uh, Bosclair, is that, am I saying the name correctly? No. Is that your husband? Yes, but you're not saying the name correctly. How do I say it? It's Boisclair. Boisclair. In conversations with me, John Boisclair and the Winston Network always stated a value for their contribution of over a million dollars to the campaign. I do not know the basis with which they use to arrive at that figure. And uh, I just want to... Uh, re- uh, to reestablish that you had never heard of this million dollar? No. no. You would agree it is a significant contribution yes, to a I project would. of Deborah Gordine's. Yes, I would. They, he also wanted me to uh, ask you for the record uh, your participation in a birthday party for Deborah Gordine. I guess she was uh, her 33rd birthday on November 30th, 1987. Uh, were you involved? Let the record show that we do not designate the number of years. We just call it a birthday. Uh, On November 3rd, 1987, um, uh, did you attend this party? Yes, I did. Did you help organize it? Yes, I did. Uh, Did your husband help organize it as well? He agreed to be the pawn that we would lure Deborah to the site of the birthday party. Mm -hmm. Uh, Who paid for it? Uh, John Mitchell paid for that. Did uh, your firm originally pay for this? No. And we never intended to pay for it. Did, did anyone else, uh, did, did you personally pay any checks or 
identity checks to start with? No, I did not. Did anyone else that you know besides no. John Mitchell? No. So the John the, the transaction was between John Mitchell and and the uh, the vendor. What the 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 place where the um, party was held was the uh, club in which my husband has a membership. Mm -hmm. But we delivered the bill directly to John. It was never our intention to pay it. Okay. So your testimony is never your intention to pay, and John Mitchell paid for it. That's correct. Um, I just would uh, would like you uh, one last time to, to tell me, um, given the incredible contacts you had with Deborah Gordine, if it's fair to say that uh, she wasn't, uh, in fact, a, a closer friend and, and not just some person that was an acquaintance. She clearly was a close friend, wasn't she, of you and your husband? She was a good friend. Pardon me? She was a good friend. Okay. Of both you and your husband. That is correct. And so she was a good friend of, of yours and, and, and even a better friend with your husband. He had known her a longer time and so on. Uh, I would classify as both good friends. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Ms. Murphy, is there any other statement you would care to make at this point? Would you indulge me for a second? Of course. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your courtesy today. I have no further statement. Well, the, uh, I would like to thank you for your <coughs> testimony. I'd like to ask you to submit the various items that have come up during the course of the hearing. and. Uh,